So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this Center for Educational Neuroscience Seminar. I believe we've got two more after this before the summer break. And I'm very happy to introduce today Fotimi Vestilopoulos, who is a PhD student in my lab in her second year. And she's going to be talking about the work she's been doing in the last year and a bit, year and a half, uh, looking at a meta-analysis of um, the impact of physical activity on children's cognition, mainly. And uh, Fortunia has got a very interesting background and I think she will weave that into her talk. So I'm not going to kind of say any, anything further about this. Um, and uh, Fortunia would prefer for you to ask questions at the end. And I think we we'll, should have plenty of time for um, questions and discussion. So looking forward to your talk, Fortunia. Okay, I'll get started. So hi everyone, um, my name is Fatini and I'm here to speak about the effects of physical activity during childhood. So a while back I was teaching yoga to a year two class and I was being observed by another teacher wishing to learn the same skills. So she came up to me after the class and she commented on how easy I made it to look and I must have been teaching for a very long time. I didn't admit it at the time but I was hiding something. I had actually just started out. And the reason it looks so easy was because of the way yoga is. It gives a clear structure. It is prescriptive in the moves you make and the general structure of the class. But I knew from my dance experience that there was something missing. They were bound by the shapes of yoga and they couldn't be completely free to express and create their own movement possibilities. I only became better at moving when I started to improvise. And I started to teach this new way, and I hoped that this would make a difference on how creative they would be and in the way that they solve problems. Education neuroscience can help show how to achieve the best outcomes, but the problem is that the research on movement doesn't paint a complete picture. Should it be aerobic activity or tennis? Practice two or three times a week. Teach repetitive movement patterns so that children have the minimum motor skills to engage with PE or give the children freedom of choice when moving to experience the effect of their own physical actions. So the one consistent message that is, is that if your child isn't moving enough, they are not benefiting mentally and physically. There is more to this story though. The science supports another message that can be ultimately empowering. In the past 20 years, there is a growing body of evidence that demonstrates the link between physical activity and cognition. Researchers first focused on regular practice of physical activity and how that increases the formation of new blood vessels and neurons in the brain and how it sustains changes in the brain structure, which may lead to improved memory and learning. So think of a hot and sweaty boot camp workout, a spin class or a juicy Zumba class that gives you the rush of adrenaline and boost of energy immediately after, but doing this over a period of time. Researchers have recently started exploring what we teach, the different characteristics such as intensity, the length of a session, or even how cognitively engaging it is. Physical activity is considered cognitively engaging when it requires complex movement patterns rather than simple repetitive movements. Neuroplasticity research supports the idea that a varied practice and new environments prom promote cognitive engagement and enhance learning. So what we know is that the body is considered a conduit that links the brain to the outside world. The nervous system creates meaning of things through experiences of the body and the brain develops and changes through these experiences. This has been termed as embodied cognition. So thousands of children have been studied to disentangle all the shaping forces that are related to physical activity and cognition. And because of the sheer volume of intervention studies, there has also been 
meta-analytic studies trying to synthesize and conclude on this topic. So previous meta-analytic evidence did not find the same pattern across intervention studies. And so one of our main aims was to consolidate that research on physical activity and cognition by using a new way to analyze meta-analytic data and include a broader range of physical activity, which actually focuses on creativity, things like dance, creative movement, or gymnastics. Both of these factors actually helped increase our sample size. One approach that has been applied before in considering whether a physical activity is cognitively engaging or not, and with a wide range of different types grouped together, they didn't consider how enriched each aspect makes them, and that can be misleading. So for example, yoga has been classified as cognitively engaging in other meta-analytic reviews, but the practice of it and instructional context is repetitive. It requires teacher demonstration, and it also lacks in group or teamwork. A teacher has a number of tools to facilitate a dynamic environment through what is taught, where it is taught, and how it is taught. And all of these can promote a creative environment and make it cognitively stimulating. It is the creative pathway that we have also chosen to focus on. So let's try something physical. You can switch your cameras off if that makes you a bit more comfortable and also move any items that may come in your way. So copy the moves that I make and I will talk you through as we go. So staying seated, fold your arms. And we're going to rock from side to side for the count of four while nodding. So one, two, three, four. Then we pace it out using the upper body. One, two, three, clap on four. Let's do that again. One two, three, four, pace it out, one, two, three, clap on four. So we use the upper body there and you're copying what I was doing. So let's use the upper body now and let's do something a little bit different. I won't demonstrate, I will talk you through an instruction. Show me just the head moving now, from straight side to side and then around and around in a curvy motion. How many ways can you bend your neck, move your head, Turn it, roll it, twist it. Can you shake it slowly, fast? How big a movement can you do with your head? How small? Move the whole body around. Can you move at different speeds, fast or slow? Freeze in a shape. Show me just your shoulders moving now. Can you lift them one at a time? Roll them, push them back, push them down. What else can you do with your shoulders? How fast can they move? How slow? Freeze in a low shape. Show me just the back moving now. Can you move the back side to side? Then like a wave, a curvy way. How many other ways can you move your spine? Freeze. So I adjusted how I instructed you to move in a dance context. Instructions can be used to adjust the task by using open-ended problem-solving instructions. So for example, show me any kind of, show me any other way to, or how would you do that differently instead of copying the teacher? This is one way a teacher can make a physical practice more creative. What are other ways to make task adjustments may be done by having tasks that are not repetitive or involves interactions with peers through partner or group work. work. For example, changing the rules of a game or altering the number of participants in the task. The environment is another factor and that can be adjusted by changing the size of the space or changing the equipment. For example, an indoor space with changing boundaries or props for the participant to respond to. And these things are like music in dance or balls in sports. Adjustment offers the student freedom of choice and to experiment, potentially supporting the development of cognition, 
through inhibiting routine movement patterns, as in inhibitory control, or flexibly switching between variable tasks as in cognitive flexibility. So let's unpack the task element first. So on the left, on the left hand side, you'll see a creativity bar. The ones on the bottom row are less creative factors. The ones on the top row are more creative. So in the first column, we have a varied practice or a repetitive practice. So repetitive would be blocked or constant training. Think of a rowing machine and just doing a 40 minute session of that. You can have real world activities like yoga or dance or technical acquisition. So doing things such as drills in any type of sport practice or even just aerobic activity. We also have, we can adjust the group or team element to it. And this involves an opponent as well. And it can be competitive or not. And it can also be, so less creative would be working on your own, like in star jumps. And the final element is divergent or convergent. So exploring movement to generate ideas. Think of the second dance example that we just went through. Convergent would be moving to generate an answer. Think of the first dance example that we went through. So applying this framework to different activities, Let's take Barbie playing tennis, for example. Playing tennis, not training. Is it varied or repetitive? It's varied. Is it real world activity or technical acquisition? It's a real world activity. Is it individual or group team? It's actually group because it includes an opponent. It's that social aspect. Is it divergent or convergent? It's divergent. And what about basketball? It's varied, it's real. It's a real world example. It's team and divergent. And what about the right hand corner, aerobic fitness training that includes things like star jumps? It's repetitive, it's technical, with technical acquisition, individual and convergent. So let's unpack the environment element now. So again, looking on the left hand side, you have the creativity bar, the top row is higher, the bottom row is lower. So first taking open-ended instructions, think of the second dance example that we just went through. It's problem solving instructions, structured improvisation. Technical instructions, so demonstrating and instructing a choreography in dance, so the first dance example that we went through. We also have open space that can be indoor or outdoor. So if you take the second dance example that we went through and put that in a gym, you can explore the whole space as opposed to just staying on the spot like we did in this first example. And fixed space, that can be a number of things, whether it's a track, a swim lane or a court, it limits the possibilities of movement. And finally props that we mentioned before, it can be music and dance or balls in sports or no props at all. So our search strategy was built around identifying key terms. So one, around physical activity, and we included uh, words like dance, gymnastics, which other reviews have not captured before. Also for the outcomes, we focused on executive functions, academic achievement, and metacognition. And in terms of the population, we focused on primary school age children between five and 12 years old. We focused on peer reviewed publications uh, written in English and published between uh, January 2000 and December 2020. And there were very few studies that focused on physical activity and educational outcomes on children before that time. Uh, the search was completed in early 2021. The focus of our review was typically developing children. So we include excluded studies that focused on developmental delay, developmental disorder, obesity, or physical or mental illness. Our search included seven electronic databases and it included PubMed and PsychInfo.
So we conducted a meta-analysis, a study of studies, and found a pattern across 75 randomized control trials, following over 19,000 children across 21 countries. And they participated in a wide range of physical activities. These were dance, traditional sports, physical activity with academic instruction, and aerobic exercise. We measured outcomes related to executive functions, metacognition, and academic performance. And it ended up being a total of 10 subdomains. It included things like working memory and inhibitory control for executive functions, fluid intelligence and creativity for metacognition, and mathematics and language for academic performance. We also tried to unpick the specific characteristics of physical activity, such as number of sessions per week, the length of one session, over what period of time the practice was, the intensity, the level of experience of the teacher, and most importantly, how creative the physical activity was. We found that only some of these subdomains benefited from physical activity. In terms of the analysis, we performed the analysis where there were at least two effect sizes for an outcome. For the second analysis, looking at the creative, at creative physical activity, we completed a meta-regression when there were at least six studies for a because it was a continuous variable. We performed the analysis in R and we used the metaphor package to do that. So we used something new, a three-level, multi-level, meta-analytic approach and this allowed us to include a large number of individual effect sizes because it's able to handle non-independent effect sizes and also nested effect sizes so for example including more than one measure from a single study and we also we converted the effect sizes we transformed them into hedges g to correct for small sample sizes So what did we find? So first note that the error bars represent the 95% confidence interval and the size of the circles correspond to the number of participants. So benefits were identified in working memory, fluid intelligence and mathematics that was small in effect and large in effect for on-task behavior. A limitation of these results is that only fluid intelligence did not have a high heterogeneity, meaning that the studies were consistent between each other. The small beneficial effect found on working memory uh, is consistent uh, with previous meta-analytic meta evidence. Uh, it could be because working memory measures are more reliable across development than other measures of cognition. Uh, fluid intelligence studies, sorry, let me just, there we go. Fluid intelligence studies reported mostly small positive effects. Uh, it could be the complexity of tasks and games children play during physical activity, which can include learning and following new sets of rules may foster fluid intelligence skills. Um, so for mathematics, approximately half of the studies had a frequency of sessions greater than three times per week. So we entered frequency as a predictor and that reduced between study heterogeneity after excluding influential effect sizes. And this didn't affect the man magnitude of the effect size that you're seeing on your screen. Half of the studies did use physical activity with academic instruction and the rest used a variety of physical activity. And we found that the type of intervention did not moderate the size of the gains observed. And this is consistent with pre previous findings and suggests that mathematic gains are not driven by knee transfer effects of academically focused interventions. Other pathways uh, for mathematics could be changes in motor skills, uh, also visual spatial short-term memory or fluid intelligence. 
motor skills have been shown to be associated with mathematic performance, and this would be in line with the theory of embodied cognition that we mentioned earlier. Um, there is also extensive evidence, uh, cross-sectional and longitudinal, uh, between working memory and fluent intelligence and mathematics. So in our study, several studies assessed both mathematics and fluent intelligence, and two of which found mathematic performance improved twice as much as fluent intelligence. So future work could test whether fluent intelligence and or working memory gains may mediate mathematic gains. Improvements, another possible mechanism is that improvements in working memory mediate fluid intelligence gains. So the outcome that did benefit the most was on-task behavior, and that was a large effect. On-task behavior may be sensitive, may be a sensitive measure because it reflects a combination of uh, cognitive abilities, for example, sustained attention, self-regulation and engagement. So it could be that physically active classes can offer a way for children to engage in academic content and therefore keep them on task. It could also be the release of adrenaline associated with physical activity, boosts children alertness and then leads to a better focus on learning. So in terms of coding the uh, studies for creativity and how creative the interventions were, Studies which measured cognition did vary in creativity. Some interventions were lower on the scale. So for example, aerobic or physical activity with academic instructions. Think of star jumps running on the spot. Others were a bit higher on the scale and they incorporated things like dance, dance choreography. Even higher on the scale, activities such as enriched PE, ball sports, gymnastics, and all creative dance. Looking at academic performance, uh, most of these were low on the creative scale when it came to physical activity with academic instructions. Uh, at the other end of the scale, uh, things such as activities such as team ball sports, creative dance, and cognitively enriched PE were used in uh, uh, interventions that measured academic performance. Studies which measured on-task behaviour did not register that high on the scale and in general had similar ratings and that's because most of them use applied physical activity with academic instruction and again it's the star jobs the running on the spot. There was only one other intervention included in on-task behaviour that was a little bit higher and that was Taekwondo. Creativity, creativity and planning outcomes is something a bit newer in this field of research and interventions used only in three studies measuring creativity as an outcome were rated high on the scale and they use thing, activities such as creative movement in the form of PE and dance. We looked at associations between creativity of a physical activity and other characteristics and we found that the number of creative elements used in an intervention was higher in studies with lower frequency of practice, uh, higher session duration and higher teacher qualification, but it didn't associate with intervention duration or the intensity of the physical activity itself. So the second part was a meta regression looking at creativity of a physical activity. First thing to note, there are two outcomes that are missing from this second analysis because there wasn't enough effect sizes to run it. The first one was creativity and four out of the five effect sizes showed participation in programs that had moderate to large beneficial effects. For planning, there were four studies that had five effect sizes in total, and only one of these led to a significant improvement in planning performance. For other outcomes, uh, the ones that led to benefits when considering creativity were on-task behavior and mathematics, and there, were, there was poorer performance in cognitive flexibility, which is something we didn't expect. So our results for maths are consistent with previous reviews, and it could be that 
the cre creative physical activity might be suited to mathematics because they share prob the problem serving nature, problem solving nature, pardon me. On task behavior had the most improvement especially when you compared it to a sedentary control group, which is the black dot on your screen. Interaction effects of creative physical activity for on-task group behavior remained in line, broadly in line when you take into account teacher qualification and mean age. And this is consistent with learning studies on primary school age children. Uh, they, which found that instruction context matters when it comes to on-task behavior. And finally, the la there were large improvements identified when considering the number of sessions per week and creativity for on-task behavior. It could be that on-task behavior requires constant reinforcement because of the added cognitive load of creativity built into that activity. So the one that we didn't expect was cognitive flexibility to have poor performance. Um, all highly creative physical activity interventions had lessons over 60 minutes and they had a negative effect. And it could be that the mental resources necessary during physical activity that interacts with higher creativity produces a cognitive load that is too much when it comes to reaping the benefits for switching between tasks. Another thing that was unexpected were the results on fluid intelligence. Because of the freedom of choice given by the instructional, instructional uh, conditions, so example, the problem solving instructions, it gives the learner time to solve a task and not perfect the same move. And we expected that the problem solving activities would transfer to the ability to reason quickly and think abstractly to solve problems in a different context. We thought the variability offered in a creative physical practice would have transfer effects that are higher than in our first ana um, analyses, even though problem solving instructions interfere with the skill, the skill being learned. So in this case, the motor skills. More work is needed in this area to understand the mechanisms behind what it is about physical activity and fluent and creativity with fluid intelligence. So our key findings and things to think about for the future. The main takeaway is that physical activity benefits on task behavior, mathematic performance, working memory and fluid intelligence. When considering these results, it is important to note there was significant evidence for publication bias for fluid intelligence, on-task behavior and working memory. Uh, on the creative side, a creative physical practice benefits both on-task behavior and mathematic performance, but not fluid intelligence or working memory. And there weren't enough studies to complete a meta-regression analysis for creativity and planning measures. Schools may want to incorporate physical activity with academic instruction for mathematics to improve both mathematic performance and on-task behavior. Researchers may want to consider testing whether fluid intelligence and or working memory gains may mediate mathematic gains and also use physically active or real world tests in cognitive subdomains. All in all, physical activity does influence how children perform, but physical activity in itself did not explain everything. Other characteristics mattered too, but not all the time. Some people can look at these findings and possibly conclude that a creative physical activity doesn't matter that you would have the same benefit pra practicing any type of physical activity, regardless of how creative it is. That feeling of freedom of choice that I experienced when I improvised in dance and that I offered to my students many years ago might be related to something else, social connectedness, mood, emotions, motivation, which has been suggested to be connected to cognition. Creativity requires the courage to let go of certainties. 
And it was the certainty in yoga that I had to let go of to embrace a more creative practice. So I want to thank, uh, pardon me, thank um, the two master's students, Holly and Yan Wen, for assisting with the data extraction. And of course, my supervisor, Iwaz, who is on this call, who helped with the guidance and structure. So what's next? Uh, I'll be running a randomized control trial intervention, and the study will assess the impact of yoga and creative dance training on primary school age children, specifically year two. And we're going to look at things like some elements of cognition, educational outcomes, and most importantly, social and emotional learning. Some instruments will assess the children directly through observation, and they will be physically active and others will request input from the parent and teacher in the form of a questionnaire. So that's pretty much it, it's short and sweet. Um, didn't want to bombard with too much information on one study. So I'll hand it over to uh, Iwaz. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Pitney, um, for the talk. So uh, I haven't seen any questions in the chat yet. Um, but feel free to raise your hand and I can ask you to speak. There's not that many of us, so um, that'd be great. Otherwise, you can type the question in the chat and I uh, will read it out loud. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, Rebecca. Hi, Patini. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I just wonder whether you came across any in, in any of the literature when you were looking at the difference between free movement and then um, I've forgotten the word you used, more structured or organised. Yeah. Yeah, um, whether there was um, anything in the area of uh, mirror neurons and how that creates learning. <laughs> I've just been looking very recently at this because I'm writing a lecture on motor cognition. So as I've been um, looking at wow. certain um, movements that activate mirror neurons and how that then relates to learning and executive function, which of course is, is very much related to a lot of the measures you use. So I just wondered whether that came up at all in any of the literature. It, it didn't because of the search was quite specific that we did. I know that there is... Um, literature out there about that. I have come across bits here and there, but because this was, it was very, very specific. Um, I didn't come across any in any of the studies themselves, the ones that we, so there were 218 studies initially, and then we filtered them down to 75. And in all of those that we, I, I didn't see, come across that, but I know that that is out there. Okay. No, thanks. That that makes sense. I just wondered. Thank you. Just to follow up, do people tend to frame the impact of physical activity on, like, as a mechanism? Talking about mm -hmm. neuro neurons. Yeah, that's true. Um, any other questions? Astrid. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, it's really helpful to me. I'm I'm currently evaluating intervention that has a physical activity component. Um, I was just wondering. I, just, I I can't remember you mentioning during the talk. Did you sort of pick apart any of the associations with um, sort of solo versus group activities and the effects that that, that might have on um, on cognitive uh, outcomes? So we actually grouped it all together. Okay. So when we coded um, all the studies, we went through all the interventions and coded the different elements. So I, yes, I do have all the information on which ones, how social they were, but we didn't run each individual element, if that, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Thank you. Yeah, um, I very much look forward to reading the paper. Is it is it out yet or no? So um, fine tuning and submitting very soon, hopefully. Lovely. <laughs> it's actually, Thank two you. papers. Thank you. I look forward to reading it. Discovered <laughs> it was such a mammoth piece of work that it had to be fit in one paper, and decided that I'd try and maybe see if we can do companion papers. Any other? Oh. A couple of questions in the chat. So Michael said that Idol Diamond has argued that exercise only improves executive function if it has a decision-making component. 
So running on the treadmill won't do it. No. What's your take on it? Uh, hang on. So can you repeat the first part of it? Yes, I have, I have, Adele Diamond. Um, oh, Adele Diamond. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So she, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So she's got um, strong views about mindless she calls it or mindful it doesn't mean to be mindful it has to be yoga but she's um there's a few papers out there rebuttal papers between different researchers about mindless and mindful activities um there's no conclusion on it um i i mean based on the study that we've done um I would lean towards what Adele Diamond is saying and and from a lived experience as well with the decision making. I mean, if you're just mindlessly running on a treadmill, um, yes, you're getting the endorphins, you know, the blood going, but that's pretty much it. So I guess that was my point in the in the presentation as well. In Although element. in your meta-analysis, the first bit, you're finding a general effect on the working memory of physical activity. Yeah, that's true. And it's not modulated by the creativity. No. So it's it's a hard one when you read the rebuttal papers and um, the, the views, you know, Adele and other people have. Um, so what's the rebuttal? What's, what's the main... So there, was, um, there were two... Re so the um, one argument... So she, she based, Adele um, published a paper uh, rebutting um, a research. It was an intervention study from another um, uh, researcher. I forget his name. Um, and they were using aerobic type activity. And she was saying that, that the, the way the study was structured wasn't you know, complete and it's mindless anyway. Um, and then they rebutted that paper saying, no, actually, what you're saying is not. Right. So what's the argument of the people who say that it does have an effect? What, what they, they did find effects, but she was unpeaking the, the way they ran their intervention. That, so that was the, the crux of it. So they did, but she's saying, well, I, I, I didn't agree how you ran your intervention. So Because they're, they're more general effect of like taking part in doing something and being sort of sticking you need your executive function to make sure that you stick to your goal and then you do it every week and so even mm. whether it, it might be mindless what you're doing it mm. you'll need to have and maybe train or practice a bit your executive skills by making sure you stick to it and then you yeah. keep at it yeah that's and true i wonder whether that could be mediating some of the effects uh lucy has uh a question um so she said that it was interesting that you found associations between certain types of physical activity and maths. Mm. And uh, she was wondering whether other studies looked at other domains as well as math, like science and English. Um, Not many. So, so actually we did look at maths and language. So I guess you could say, yes, English. We didn't find any for language. And we were thinking that language is not compatible to that problem solving nature. It's that point again, where maths, does have that characteristic and so does physical activity whereas language doesn't so as much um less on science maybe um the, i think one study um rare very rare maybe one was geography as well um and that's pretty much it it's mostly maths and english i guess yeah, the other link with maths might be more about space right mm -hmm. kind of spatial mm -hmm. processing that's not necessarily needed for english but might be for maths and and physical activity and then michael um creativity tends to encourage like lack of focus so to consider mm -hmm. uh, myriad alternative possibilities and so would you say that creative exercise tend to reduce focus attention or inhibit your control reduce it um mm. Well, we didn't find any effects on that, so it's a valid point. Um, I mean, we didn't find that. I mean, you didn't find any association between creativity and no. your control, but you did find a negative one for cognitive flexibility. Yeah, exactly. And um, I guess the point, a bigger, maybe a broader point, um, with the randomized control trial, I am including self-regulation in the broader sense. Um, and seeing how that um, is affected by yoga and a creative dance intervention. So um, I guess look out for that space more. There's more to it, I guess. And then we've got another question from Pina. Um, 
and she was say, asking whether you conducted any methodological quality assessment for the included studies. Uh, say, say that again. Also, um, what um, the quality. quality assessment? Yeah, so we used, um, uh, so it's the EPHPP, uh, the quality assessment tool. Um, and we found a risk of bias was generally low. Um, and what else? Actually, I've got this. I've got them. Um, hang on. I can share my screen if you like. So they, they see. Yep. Um, hang on. Uh, let me go back to Zoom. Where is this? Uh, uh, just bear with me. Oops, where's Zoom? Oh, share screen. Oh, hang on a sec. Let me just get to. Oh, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So you can see there what we've, um, the risk of bias, hang on a sec. So let me just move zoom, it's in the way for me. So I can't read it. Um, yeah, so the overall risk of bias was low, but um, blinding of participants uh, was not so great. Uh, and that's, just because of the nature of it's the educational context. So you can see it there. Okay, great. Any other questions? Let's see. Anything else? Uh, oh, there's another one okay. uh, from Pinya again. Um, you included children between five and 12, and uh, she's ask, um, asking whether the effects are different in younger and older children. So did you put age as a covariate? Yeah, so we did put that in and it's, um, no, in that age group. There are other, there are other meta-analytic studies that looked at children and adolescents, and yes, but not within this age group itself, didn't find. And so what did they, they study find between children and adolescents? Uh, it, it depended on the um, the outcome. Um, I can't, off the top of my head, I don't remember, but they did find differences in certain outcomes. I can't remember if it was maths or some uh, cognition outcomes. Thanks. Okay, last chance for questions. All right, well, thank you very much, Fatimi. Um, for having me. And, uh, well, I'm sure everyone seems will look forward to the paper. Maybe we can circulate it. <laughs> once they come um, and we'll um, and Natasha I don't know whether you want to talk about the, the seminar next week yeah um, thank you so next week will be um, Brittany Cher um, who's a PhD student in my lab currently although she's she did just defend so she's on her way out um, we'll be talking about um, uh, noise uh, again we're going to have another um, uh, one talk about how noise affects some um, attention, etc. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll be good. Thank you so much, Patini. It was really, really interesting. Bye, everyone.